So there's a lot of points to cover today. Um, so this is the, yeah, there's a lot of points I need to cover today. Uh, or we're gonna go and talk about a range of subjects. We're gonna talk about sociology. We're gonna talk about history. We're gonna talk about mathematics and computer science. We are going to talk, and that's one of my, that's what I really love. We can basically, when we can basically tie things together. Um, just a heads up to anybody who is, to, to everybody here that we are going to be talking about, uh, this is where basically if I, if I were to put a trigger warning on stuff, I'd say yes, because it's pretty much everything because the Nazis left no stone unturned when it came to depredations of human dignity. So just be aware of that. Um, the, so now our focus today is this paper, navigation in a small world. Okay, um, which is that basically, um, this is a this is one of my favorite papers because and it's worthwhile. It's if you're going into if you are interested in doing graduate work, this is possibly a paper I would recommend reading because it is one page long. It's amazing when you can get papers that that long. This piece of brilliance, which has been heavily cited, was it was was written by John Kleinberg. Uh, who's a professor at Cornell. Um, and this is talking about navigating and routing in a small world. Okay, and uh, we don't really talk, you know, and, and what's interesting is that basically the very first citation he gives here is not a computer science paper. It is the small world phenomena, which is the principle that most of us are linked by short links, uh, chains of acquaintances, was first a bit uh, instigated as a question in sociology, okay? Um, and that citation is for Milgram, S in Psychology Today, one, pages 61 to 67. So who is, and so this gives us, this is the rabbit hole of this paper. Because if you decide to go and look up this paper, you will, or, or the author, you get into a rabbit hole. So what, who was Stanley Milgram? Any takers on that one? It is one of the more important names to know in psychology. So it's worthwhile to know who Stanley Milgram is because of him. And very few things I believe are coincidences personally. Um, at the same time, I believe a lot of stuff it just happens and really isn't that consequential, but things just, do kind of connect it with each other. Uh, Stanley Milgram is part of the reason why we have IRBs. Um, anybody know what an IRB is? Okay, the, uh, an IRB is an institutional review board. Okay, IRBs are institutional review boards. Um, and they were set up and they kind of got their start at, in 1974 after uh, Health and Human Services basically caught a, had, had a report um, that basically said that we need to roll that that basically experimentation on humans needs to have needs to be balanced by three factors. Not that it's wrong, but that basically it's when done correctly, it has to balance three factors. It needs to balance. It needs to address beneficence respect of personhood, and justice. So respect of personhood. The idea here is that when you do experiments on people, you respect people as autonomous people. And that if they cannot, basically that, pe that people are respected as people who can make decisions for themselves, okay? And that people who cannot make decisions for themselves, be them children or prisoners or, or, people who are mentally compromised in some way, that their autonomy is also respected and, res and they we respect the fact that they cannot make full decisions for themselves and that they are entitled to additional protections. What this means is that when we do experiments on people nowadays, we have something called informed consent, which means that you are, uh, you are going to be told what the risks are of the experiment and what possible risks there are to you. Beneficence means that we aren't just gonna do this for the lulls. It means that we are doing this experiment because we believe that it will benefit society in some way, okay? 
um, this go basically there's two parts. The first, do no harm, kind of a Hippocratic oath part. But also then we want to minimize the possible risks and maximize the possible gains. Um, a lot of experiments where we're just asking people or gathering with uh, data on people where we're just asking people for data, you know, like a survey or something like that. That's got like almost no minimal risks if um, if it's just generalized. If we're asking you about trauma, though, that does have possible risks, right? But we inform you of that. But that is part of the informed consent pro procedure, and that's part of the respect for personhood. Third is justice, which is again an amorphous thing. But the idea here is that we aren't just doing this research for a select number of people. We aren't basically going to uh, do this research. To, to create something that only is going to benefit like two people, right? Um, this isn't just some mad scientist pro uh, project to, to basically, uh, to, you know, mad scientist supervillain project that's basically going to benefit his wife and his, in, and his obsession, all of Mr. Freeze. This is something that basically will benefit, oh, you know, will benefit people in general and is going to be, you know, benefit society as whole. Um, these kind of things you are intrinsically linked, I feel, with, you know, democratic values. But the reason we have this is, be is because uh, as humanity, because as humans, we kind of messed up in this whole, in th this whole process. Uh, Milgram is part, it wasn't necessarily, Milgram was part of that, but also, but not as on a big scale. Uh, the Stanford, a, pr a prison experiment, where basically people took roles of prisoners and and guards and were given very little instruction in that matter and people fell into those roles well and that degraded magnificently let's just say um so that the experiment had to be prematurely stopped those are two of the things that we've done here in the u.s but there were other reasons namely the nazi human experimentation that occurred during the Holocaust and World War II um, that caused that. The reason for IRBs are varied. And if we look that up on Wikipedia, it does have a, a, a list, Institutional Re Review Board, also known as, an, basically it's to make sure that when we do research on people, because, and, and, and that's not like medical experimentation, we're talking about anything that interacts with other human beings that that is going to be okay. So reasons, the experiments of Nazi physicians, post-World War II's doctor trial, which was about that stuff. Um, the Tuskegee uh, syphilis experiment, which, um, yeah, that was great. Long-term human experimentation on, on, on poor rural African-Americans, infecting them with syphilis and subjecting to them that and studying them long after a cure for syphilis, or sorry, treatments for syphilis were available caused needless human suffering. Um, humorous radiation experiments during Cold War, but then other things like Milgram obedience, Stanford prison, and MK Ultra. So um, now the citation here isn't, in this paper, isn't the Milgram obedience experiment, but to know Milgram, uh, you gotta know about that experiment and what that was about. So Milgram is famous for the Milgram obedience experiment, which came about in the 50s, okay? Um, and that is a, uh, a study on authority. Um, and that goes back to, again, because there's no, uh, because in this kind of stuff, there's no coincidence, it goes back to the Nazis. So this man, is Adolf Eichmann, one of the people uh, responsible for murdering half my family. Uh, he uh, was in charge of logistics for the, for the Holocaust, in charge of, as they put it, liquidating Jews, moving them from one area to another to get them into extermination camps. But it wasn't also extermination camps. It was also the Einsatzgruppen, which were roving bands of uh, SS men who would go in the Eastern Front and essentially execute people by shooting them in the head. They moved to extermination camps because that was less traumatic for the people doing the shooting. 
as part of the reason. And if you want a full history of Nazi Germany, I recommend you read Richard, uh, Richard J. Evans' uh, Third Reich Trilogy, which is meant for that general introduction into, into Nazi Germany. Um, now, what happened is, is that most, at, at the end of World War II, most Nazi war criminals were captured, but many escaped uh, through what were called rat lines. Uh, many escaped to Argentina. Not really sure why Argentina, but I think that's because there was a strong German population already present there. But many of them escaped to uh, Argentina. Um, Adolf Eichmann was one of them using some uh, Nazi sympathizers who were uh, members of the Catholic Church there to uh, move him around. Um, and uh, he basically uh, uh, fled to Argentina until the 50s. Um, now, what happened, he changed his name, but he, uh, when the rest of his family went to meet him, he did, well, despite being very good at logistics and organization, he really wasn't that smart of a man because while he changed his name, he didn't change his kids' names. Um, so uh, what happened is that uh, one of the people, well, his, his son started dating a, a girl, Sylvia, whose dad was blind, but um, recognized the Eichmann name because he was half Jewish and imprisoned in a concentration camp. And he did some digging and he basically alerted the Israeli authority, the, the newly formed state of Israel. Hey, uh, I think there's a Nazi war criminal, you know, famous one that you're looking for here. And it actually took a rather amount of kicking in the ear uh, to get them to come and check that out. But he was, but a blind man basically investigated this because uh, his daughter was dating the son of this uh, war criminal. It's a fascinating story. Um, now, at that point, Israel had a choice, um, which was to extradite him or to ask for, or just abduct him. Extradite meaning basically ask the country of Argentina to please, you know, hand this, arrest this guy and hand him over. And they chose the latter because with the case of Joseph Mengele, the known, uh, who is known as the angel death, he escaped um, when, Germany, when Germany tried to extradite, when Western Germany tried to extradite Mengele. Uh, Mengele died um evading capture um he died of drowning i think after having a stroke or something anyway long story short so anyway after that israel was like well this is going to piss off argentina uh but they're a hemisphere away so um so they sent in uh, Mossad agents and captured this guy and brought him to trial in in uh in the 60s. Uh, during that uh, time, he did not deny the Holocaust or his role in organizing it, but claimed he was just simply following orders in a totalitarian, totalitarian system. Uh, he was found guilty on all the charges he was done, and he was the second and final person who's been executed in Israel, giving uh, is Israel has executed two people, the first of which was proven innocent after the fact. So that kind of shows, yeah, turned out the guy was uh, not as treasonous as they thought they, he was. So anyway, uh, we, can, we, can get into, we can get into a whole side discussion about capital punishment at some point and, and the issue of, of not correcting this. But honestly, I don't feel too bad when it comes to people like Eichmann. Uh, anyway, it was very widely followed in the media because it was televised. And one of the people who watched it was Stanley Milgram. Uh, three months after the start of the trial, he began this experiment, which is that he kind of wanted to know, could it be that they were, that all of his accomplices in the Holocaust were just following orders? Could, could we call them accomplice, accomplices? What, or was there, was there something specifically rotten about the German people? Of course condemning entire people like that, but I mean, he asked the question. But the idea here is that do people just follow orders? And um, so let's see, that is not that. So let's go ahead and see where we can, uh, Milgram authority, and we can find that uh, out of results here. Mil, sorry, Milgram authority 
experiment because I was reading, I was reviewing it this morning and I, you know, I actually decided to go and read the paper. Um, always um, a dangerous thing to do. Uh, here we go, original paper. Nope, not the original paper. That's just simply a, uh, I had it on my phone. Why can't I find it here? Uh, which is sort by date. Can we sort by the other way of date, please? I want the oldest possible paper, not the newest. No, 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 no. So give me a second. Um, oh, here it is. First described it in his journal. Here's the link. Why, why was I doing that? Behavioral study of obedience. So let me go ahead and explain the... Um, uh, such an old study and yet it's behind a paywall, which is fine. You just simply go to Google, you pump it in or you go, and you hit the PDF button and boom, because somebody's posted it somewhere. Anyway, that's again, uh, paywalls in science are another discussion, which is, uh, but, but suffice my opinion is that they are total BS and don't feel bad for ignoring them. Um, so anyway, the idea here is, is that we had, is that the experiment was 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 done like so? You had the experimenter who basically was an authority figure. He would wear a lab coat, and you'd have two people come in: the teacher and the learner. Now, the learner was actually a collaborator. So this is not an uncommon practice in psychology uh, studies. This this form of deception, where basically the the study is rigged. Where you're and, and you're told that basically that there are multiple participants just brought in off the street, but the other participants are actually all grad students who are in on it. In this case, it was an actor who was in on it. Um, and basically pulling a name out of a hat, you, 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 you pull a name out of the hat to figure out whose role it is. So it was in your mind equally likely which chair you'd be in, but you're not, um, but you're uh, but really it was, you know, all. That's just performance. That's just theater to get you into the idea here. Now, the idea here is that um, you, as the, as the teacher, what you're going to do is that you are separated into different rooms. And the idea here is that this guy's going to answer multiple choice questions. The learner's going to answer multiple choice questions. And when he gets them wrong, he'll receive a shock. And as he gets them wrong, and the teacher is the one who delivers the shock. And as it gets wrong, and as the shocks go up, people, you know, the shock will increase in value. Okay. Um, so the volts range from 15 to 450 would go up in 15 volt increments. Uh, the, basically, it's learning word pairs, is kind of the idea. It's uh, kind of it's like in a memory experiment. Um, and the idea here is, is that basically when the, the, when, the exper when the teacher wanted to halt the experiment, the experimenter was given specific instructions as what to say. They were to say, please continue or please go on, or it, the experiment requires that you continue. You have, it is absolutely essential that you continue. You have no choice, you must go on. If, and these are escalating, uh, if all four six prods to continue are 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 you know if the prods are not accepted, then the experiment is halted only then. So the results, uh, let's say they are one some of the most depressing of human uh, in human history, of forty people, which were with and here's the age breakdown from 20 to 50, all men, but later experiments showed this was just as valid with women as well. This has been repeated multiple times. Um, and the idea here is, is that, so here's the prods, this one, and here's the experiments as to where people stopped giving shocks. That was what they were measuring. When would people stop giving shocks? And they believed it wouldn't really go much past this. But as you notice, 
zeros until we get to 300 points where it was an intense shock where the, where the person, where the actor who's not actually being shocked by you, he's just pretending, but the person giving the shock doesn't know that, is basically um, at this level, 300 volts, the, the victim kicks the wall and is no longer providing answers to the teacher's multiple choice questions. At that point, five people drop off. After that, following that, four people drop off. And it goes on. Um, however, there's a point leveled XXXX and 26 of the 40 people deliver what is essentially a fatal shock. Um, of the note here, and that's you know the majority, 26 out of 40. Uh, some people who are, are saying, uh, well, he's trying to communicate, he's knocking. Well, it's not fair to shock the guy. These are terrific bolts. I don't think this is very humane. Oh, I can't go on with this. No, this isn't right. This is a hell of an experiment. There's a guy suffering there. No, I don't want to go on. This is crazy. Another person saying, he's banging in there. I'm going to chicken out. I'd like to continue, but I can't do that to a man. I'm sorry, I can't do that to a man. It will hurt his heart. You take your check. No, really, I couldn't do it. These subjects were frequently highly agitated, even angered. Some, sometimes verbal protest was a minimum, and the subject simply got up from his chair in front of the shock generator and indicated he wished to leave the laboratory. Of the, 20, of the 40 subjects, 26 obeyed orders that the experimenter went to the end, proceeding to punish the victim until they reached the most potent shock available on the shock generator. At that point, the experiment stops. Um, so yeah. It was surprising because nobody thought that, none of the experimenters thought that would go this far. But uh, even afterwards, many people, after the stop, many obedient subjects appeared heavy sides of release, mopped their brows, rubbed their fingers over their eyes, or nervously fumbled cigarettes. Some shook their heads, apparently in regret. There, some subjects remained calm throughout the experiment and only re received minimal signs of tension from beginning to end. So the idea here is, is that and now this basically sent ripples through everything. Um, now there is basically whether or not this is applicable to the Holocaust because, you know, this is a person you're shocking, a person you never really met versus a person you might hate. Um, and whether or not it's doubt, but there's basically a whole lot of different discussions as to whether being more authoritative matters. Yes. Were they able to interview the participants after the experiment completed? I don't know. Um, I mean, I don't think so. Uh, but I don't know. I mean, there is kind of. I mean, the participants. The participants were. In, I mean, that's how you got those quotes from the participants. But the people being shocked, I don't know what kind of the. Avenon. But there's a lot of been reproductions of this, a lot of replications of this, uh, because people want to see this. Like um, in 2009, they were able to get approval from an IRB by modifying several of the experimental protocols to make it okay for the for actual ethics. Because you know, you think you killed somebody that might traumatize you for like life or something. <laughs> um, and in addition, half the replication participants were, were female and the rates of obedience were virtually identical to the male. They also include a condition where the participants first saw another participant refuse to continue. However, the participants in this condition obeyed at the same rate as the ones in the base condition. It is kind of crazy that basically that people will just go with the flow. And that's kind of the stuff that Mil and Milgram got into that, which is interesting and it's extremely valuable research. Don't get me wrong, but it wouldn't pass muster in today. I mean, we've got stuff there that, we're, that would pass muster, but as originally written, this doesn't pass muster. So anyway, this prompted the calls for an IRB, uh, sorry, for a, for a lot of different things. Uh, I, so, uh, and that's part of the reason why basically like human experimentation is very heavily regulated, you know, because it needs to be. Again, those three principles, beneficence, respect for, pe for people, and justice. But 
that isn't what was, uh, but that is essentially what Milgram is known for. But that is also not what we cited in the paper. So again, it is easy to, when you're doing research, it is super easy to fall off the, into a rabbit hole of stuff. And it's important to fall off that rabbit hole sometimes so you can learn about things like this first link, which is Milgram's other experiment, uh, which is on small world networks, which is the idea here in small world networks. Um, it, so small world networks are graphs and we've got a couple of different uh, kind of graphs over here. Come on, I wanna, Full-sized image, boo, okay, there we go. So we have a couple, we've got this get a hard to see this bit of a blurry thing, but we've got three different kinds of graphs that have been generated here. Uh, random graphs, small world graphs, and scale-free graphs. Scale-free graphs are actually quite interesting. This is what we would see with the uh, internet, with, with the internet. So essentially that you have a lot of nodes that uh, have a huge number of connections. A scale-free network is one that follows this power law distribution. So you have a lot of nodes who have one connection, but you have a couple of like super connectors right here. And that's the way like a lot of communication networks work, like in the internet. So important kind of thing. The small world network, it resembles a random, but it's a bit more structured. Um, and it is exactly what the kind, and, it, and if you are thinking of what it means to be a small world, then you are exactly correct. Because it is exactly the Kevin Bacon network. It is the network that allows you to say that this person is, you know, six degrees from, sec, uh, from Kevin Bacon. So the small world experiment done by Milgram was actually, was, did not involve traumatizing people. Um, it instead involved, uh, so let's see. Um, small world problems from psychology today, journal articles. So that one involved basically what happened is that uh, they wanted to see what kind of connections humans, humans, have. this was more sociology than psychology. So the idea, the goal of the experiment was to measure how interconnected people were. So the idea here was, is that they recruited people in Kansas and they sent them instructions with a bunch of prepaid envelopes and said, hey, do you know this person? After they've recruited them, they said, do you know this person? If you know this person, who is a stockbroker in Boston, it turns out, if you know this stockbroker in Boston, please you know, write down his address and, and mail it to him directly. If you do not, please forward this mail and these instructions to the person you think is most, that you know who is most likely to know this person. So, Think about this, like for a second. How would you send if you have if you if there's this person you need to get mailed to in Korea, South Korea, real Korea? Um, okay, how would you send any? How would you send some mail to them? Well, do you know? Do you know this person? If not, do you happen to know anybody in Korea? It's not impossible. A lot of a lot of students have done exchange programs in Korea, or are from Korea, or know people, or more likely know a person who's been to Korea at some point in their life. So you'd probably forward that mail to them. And this is a similar kind of thing, right? I don't know somebody who uh, lives in Boston, Massachusetts, but I know somebody who lives in New York and that's like at least in the right geographic area. So I'm gonna send it there. Uh, and then I'm going to send that to, um, and then that person could probably send it to Boston and that person in Boston probably nobody knows somebody who works in finance, okay? And that person who works in finance probably can send it along to that person. And what it kind of turns out for this one is that, uh, and this is the paper on that, internal structural chains of those, um, yeah, 296, Okay, so it was Nebraska. Sorry, Nebraska, not Kansas. Uh, 296 initial volunteers. And of course they didn't recruit the people who fully did, you know, they didn't recruit the later people. So some, some of the chains just died because yeah, I'll get to it eventually. And they didn't. 
Um, so of those, uh, so only like 64 of them eventually made it. And that's because, you know, participation in the experiment, but this is the amount of people, the number of intermediaries that it had to go through. Somebody knew somebody who knew them. That was fairly, um, but the vast majority were around the four to six range, especially spiking in the six. And it pretty much holds for pretty much people in humanity, the whole six degree of se separation. It, it, that pretty much holds. Um, mathematically, part of the reason is, is because of, um, is because of this, is we can see that kind of in this paper, which is navigation in a small world. Um, and what we have here is this kind of what they call, what he calls a lattice graph. And it says, hey, we've got this node here, U. This is the, our start node, okay? And, and what does it mean a lattice? It's arranged in the grid, okay? Uh, Two-dimensional grid. And he's saying, hey, I've got this guy. He's got direct connections to nodes A, B, C, and D. Basically, his north, south, east, and west. And then he has one random link, one random, just one random nodes he knows somewhere in the network. Okay, just some kind of random node. And that randomness here was what they're saying is basically that they've got some exponents that basically they're saying, hey, how do we distribute this? How far should I try to, you know, am I just picking stuff at random or am I giving more weight to stuff that is closer or further away? Okay, and that deals with some math here with their clustering exponent, but it's not too bad. Um, and then basically it's saying, hey, how, how if we've got this greeting out a greedy routing algorithm, how long does it take? And it turns out that if you set it up right, you can get the time to find somebody in log of, if you only have one link to be log of n squared. Of course, people don't just know five people. How many people do you know, actually? Does anybody know what the or what the what the approximate human kind of let's say the amount of person, the number of people a person is capable of caring about. Do you know what that, uh, when the, that number is, the number of people you can have meaningful relations it with? So yeah, it's in the hundreds. It's like, well, I've, I've heard 100. Yeah, it's a pretty large number of people you can have meaningful relationships with and keep track of. It's actually really surprising because, which should give you a bit of nice, Hope for humanity compared to uh, those those the last twenty minutes, you know. Uh, uh, people are so, and a lot of the people you know and are able to form relationships with are in this kind of thing. But you have these long distance relationships, and you're really not that separated from anybody else. Um, and we see that with uh, and so when we talk about you know small world networks, we sometimes talk a lot about like. Um, you know, again, uh, all these kind of, with graphs, we were talking typically modeling like this communication networks. But what's wonderful about networks and kind and graphs is that they model relationships between people. And scale-free and small world networks are one of those that model relationships between people. Cultural networks, social influence, uh, semantic networks. They, they, there's a lot of different ones, but also the things that we don't think of, like uh, networks of brain neurons, voter networks, electrical power grids. Um, and what's wonderful is that these things are very robust. Um, and graph theory just kind of appears everywhere if you look for it. Um, it's one of those things that's wonderful. But Again, what what this reason that we kind of have the six because there's only so many is because there's so many people that we know, and only so many humans. Um. This so there so I'm just trying to say that graph uh, theory comes up in a lot of places. Um. Now the other kind of network again, what we see is that scale free network. Uh, small world networks can change from scale free to broad scale class when when it follows a power law for adding these new links. That's what they're saying. But yeah, and notice that over there it was uh, six degrees to seven uh, bacon. Kevin Bacon. Ah, hey, small world experiment. Uh, and again, this is like I like it when we actually can see. Ah, here's an idea. 
a kind of the map of how that worked over here. Um, which is that it got from start to finish in that original path. There are some criticisms, of course, bias. Uh, some communities such as the Seminole Lees are completely isolated. Um, six degrees of Kevin Bacon, parlor game. Um, but anyway, scale-free networks, going back to that. Um, where did I have that tab? Oh, scale-free network, there we are. So scale-free network follows a power law distribution. That means that the number of edges basically fall, uh, for each node follow this distribution. So some, uh, most nodes will have like one edge and some will have two and less of those will have three. And it kind of, ex and only a very few will have a lot of edges. Um, think of it like that person you know who seems to know everybody. You know, you know, there's this there. Everybody seems to have that one friend that every other friend knows, and you're not sure how your friends know this person. All right. So kind of this drawing over here. This is another type of network network besides the small world network. Right. And small world networks are basically have these random jumps between people. And there's random network. People are just connected to who's adverse close to them. Scale free networks have these big hubs that everybody communicates through. Okay. Um, let's see. I mean, this kind of picture of, of the internet, that this partial picture of the internet, that's a scale-free network. Uh, it's hard to see, but you do see that basically there are these stars here that have an inordinate amount of connections. Mm -hmm. So, Graph theory again occurs everywhere. Occurs everywhere, and as I mentioned, like graph theory. If you watch my videos, graph theory occurred when you had, you know, kind of that origin of mathematical stuff is the bridges of Konigsberg. You know, that puzzle of how can we figure out how to, how to go across these bridges. Uh, but again, it's kind of amazing that this kind of stuff is all about human relationships. Um, the last kind of graph I want to talk about or kind of graph related thing is uh, something that I worked on personally, which are uh, Voronoi diagrams, which sound really complicated, but as soon as you see them, they become extremely easy to understand. But this is a Voronoi tessellation. Uh, it's a 2D plane. And each of these points, and basically what's going on here is that each of these, uh, the region it gets color, the entire space gets colored. The way it gets colored is that everything that's closest to one point has the same color. So all the space that is closest to this dot over here is colored red. And knows that, that basically as the points get closer to the yellow point, to this point, it's colored a different color. So basically it's a way of shading things based off of, po off of points. Uh, we see this a lot in nature. Um, the idea here where, where we just have these central points and things just fill in and kind of bubble out evenly. Um, and, and these, and of course, you can change your distance metric, right? This is you, this is this is Euclidean distance, which is what we typically think of distance, you know, your two-dimensional kind of distance. And then there's Manhattan distance, right? Which is you know, where diagonal doesn't exist, right? In, in really in Manhattan. Um, so what's really cool about this is that it is, um, is that the dual graph or Voronoi uh, triangulation corresponds to the Delune triangulation. What in, the, what in the world? Dual graph is basically that, uh, that basically that we've kind of got this, it, it's kind of the inverse of the graph. Notice that the blue graph, it comes, it has this space over here that it encapsulates, okay? So, right, we've got this node, the blue nodes. We've got blue, 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 and they're connected by these vertices and they kind of create shapes, right? So if we put a, a red node inside each of those shapes and connect them, 
appropriately. And then we, and then notice that we have this entire space that's outside the graph, right? And put a single node there because that's also a space that's been created by the shape. That is the dual graph. And you can basically, if you have one, you, if you create one, you can generate the other. And dual problems are actually these fascinating problems where basically it doesn't seem like it, but here's a the lunar triangulation. And uh, the idea here for lunar triangulation is that you get these uh, points P and you try to circumcircle them. Basically, you create. So notice that basically, for every uh, for every three points, we draw a circle around them. Um, so they minimize the. So rather, for each of the inter, or rather, another way of putting looking at this is you've got all these uh, points that are meted out by these circles, and all the intersections form these tri triangles. And what it is, is that what's interesting is that if you look at the center of all these circles that we have, they actually give you the center points of a Voronoi diagram, which is interesting. You got these two problems, which are really weird and unrelated to each that seem unrelated on the surface, but they're literally the same problem. There's actually a lot of that in computer science, where, where things turn out to be the same problem. And that solving one gives you the other. Okay, uh, the most notable ones are for what we call NP-complete problems. Okay, now we talked about NP-completeness, right? NP-completeness is that, and to review, NP-completeness, again, it's something that we go into a bit more detail later on, hopefully. But the idea here is that you've got some problems that are really, 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 really hard to solve but are relatively quickly easily verified. So something that is hard to figure out, but you've got the ability to, to check it, to, to, uh, but you've got the ability to uh, solve, to verify your solution very quickly. Um, now, here is the thing about MP completeness, okay? Hamiltonian path problem. We've kind of saw that earlier in the class. Graph coloring. Um, traveling salesperson. We've, I probably just, did I discuss the traveling salesperson? Yeah, I'm in a video. I'm pretty sure I did, which is, you know, I want to, I've got, I got to fly to all these cities and all of these, all these cities, which I can fly to one to another, got to minimize my cost. Um, can I find a path? that visits every vertice exactly once. These are all NP-complete. Uh, another NP-complete, the longest path. You'd think that figuring out what, you know, with the, you know, it's pretty easy to find, you know, we've got these algorithms for the shortest path and they work pretty well, like Dijkstra's. Hardest part about Dijkstra's, remember, is spelling it correctly, but uh, it's really not, uh, once you get a hang of it, Dijkstra's is fairly easy to get, to do. Um, but one of the, well, but uh, the longest path, as it turns out, is an MP complete problem. Figuring out what is the longest route from A to B. You'd think that'd be tough, but uh, sorry, easy because you know anybody can <laughs> can can come up with something more expensive than the uh, than the shortest thing. Um, graph coloring, which is another interesting pro problem, which is uh, adjacent vertices need to be colored differently. Where does this kind of problem come in? Uh, this comes in with maps a lot, right? When you're trying to do a classical map, you don't want countries that are next to each other to be the same color, right? Because then you can't tell that where the borders are clear. I mean, there's some countries that might like that, <laughs> but you know, um, some countries are like, yeah, make my those neighbors the same color as me. I'm sure that's going to be no confusion whatsoever. Um, but um, but the idea, but you know, this is kind of the thing where we're trying to show separation here. This is an NP complete problem. Um, <clears throat> now, the, here's the shocking thing about NP complete problems they're all the same one. 
you solve one part of what makes problems incomplete mp complete is that you can take any mp complete problem and transform it into any other mp complete problem okay which means if you solve one you solve them all um which is part of the reason why we want to know whether it's possible because something like uh oh uh, factorization figuring out the factors of numbers and be complete and considering our encryption algorithms work on being able to factor uh you know figure out the factors of of the multiplication of two two prime numbers it's pretty important that that this is hard to do um but they're all the same problem and that's kind of amazing that like you've got all these problems that are that are the same. So whenever you find something that you aren't sure is a problem that you can solve, see if it is, you know, something that can be trans. If there's something that's similar that can't be transformed. Also, don't just you know, don't stop looking at problems or learning about stuff because you never know when you might find something that's applicable. A lot of there's a lot of cross pollination between sciences today. You know, you've got a paper from psychology by an author whose whose main contribution is the fact that he's got a, a, a paper on on human obedience. That is part of the reason that we have IRBs. Um, that his that one of his side papers was a was all, was a sociology paper that's now a fundamental tenant of graph theory. You know, pretty crazy connections there. Um, you know, um, you gotta, uh, there's an astronomy paper that basically deals with uh, these, um, you know, you know, when I was doing undergraduate, when I was doing graduate work with Fourier transformations, I, I was basically told, yeah, Fourier transformations in order to figure out the periodicity of something, you need these, e you know, you need this evenly, uh, you know, evenly division events or e evenly observed events. But astronomers, they don't get that luxury. So they have their own algorithms and they figured out how to, how to observe periodicity of objects when you don't have evenly observed events because sometimes there's a giant ball of fire in the way or the sky is cloudy. You know, so you can't evenly observe things. So, and that kind of thing is like useful for Q network, you know, for figuring out, uh, you know, load times in, in for your buffers. If you're interested in going into graduate school for science, you know, it's interesting. I would suggest starting with this paper and starting to read this uh, this paper, this uh, single page paper by Kleinberg, it, because it's a good paper. It's very rare that you get something that's good and one page long. Yeah, it's got three columns, but you know, it's not nobody's perfect. Um, they, they only had so much space in the magazine. Um, so I, if you're interested in grad school, again, check out this paper. And, you know, the math is scary, but it's not like abysmal. You know, they use, a, a lot of times we use Greek letters. Um, I feel like we use Greek letters more to, uh, more to be scary than anything else. But part of that is also just typographically. You're able to tell what's a very at a glance you can tell that that's a variable versus you know a letter <clears throat> that just makes it again that just kind of makes it look scary um so yeah that's what my lecture is today on small world networks and the connection between these kinds of st stuff um also again there is a um uh when it comes to like stuff like uh irbs and like um, if you're interested in working with people, I, I made it sound like super restrictive. There is a lot of stuff that is, a lot of this are just safe, simply safety rails that have been set up to make sure that, you know, there are protections in place. Like for instance, I cannot uh, give you, I cannot do research on you, even though I'm teaching you, I can't get research, do research and take that with results. And I can't force you to do without getting approval. And I can't also like give you a, survey and force you to come uh to that i'm going to use for research 
and then say that that survey is part of the grade so then ensure that I get results. And the reason for this is that uh, because that'd be coercion and I can't coerce you because that's violating that respect for people. So there's very, there's, there's even practical protections just as students. Um, now that doesn't stop psychologists from being allowed to play tricks in, in class and replicate them to kind of prove a point. My favorite is the learned helplessness experiment. And this is our last point for the lecture. The learned helplessness ex uh, classroom demonstration, not experiment because it's a classroom demonstration because they want to show you basically how easy it is to fall into this trap is that people are, is that the class is handed out word scrambling exercises. You are given three words to unscramble. The trick is for the half the class, the first two words are impossible to unscramble. So the teacher will, un will basically give people time to do the first one. Half the class is gonna feel like idiots because they can't unscramble that first word. The second class, and then they'll unscramble, you'll unscramble, the, try to unscramble the second word and half the class will feel like idiots. And then for the third word, which is the same for both, for both groups, well, the people who are doing it, they'll be able to unscr unscramble it. But the people for the first for whom the first two were impossible will have already fallen into what's called learned helplessness, which is that they have already been primed to believe that they cannot do it and fail to do it. It's an extremely, it's a demonstration that takes barely five minutes and it is extremely potent. Um, is that an experiment on people? No, we're not gathering data. We're showing, we're demonstrating uh, basically how it easy it is though to perform an experiment. Useful teaching method. Um, my favorite, the other uh, favorite experiment I have is the dot is the um, is the ten dollar auction um, in economics. If you're aware of this, pretend this is a ten dollar bill, not one dollar bill. Okay, and say I'll have ten dollars. We're going to have a dollar auction for it. The idea here is that basically you are going to, you can auction in increments of a dollar how much you're going to pay for this ten dollar bill. The kicker is that both the highest bidder and the second highest bidder have to pay up. So you're like, I want one dollar. I'm gonna, well, I'm gonna bid a dollar to buy ten dollars, and somebody's gonna say, well. Okay, I'm willing to pay two dollars for ten dollars. Then the per, then three dollars. Oh well, no, I want three. And then as you get closer to ten, you realize the trap, which is that the person who bid nine dollars, sorry, the person who bid eight dollars, well, he's outbid by the person who's willing to pay nine dollars to get one dollar profit. The person who bid eight realized, wait, that rule that says it's the second highest person has to pay. I'm out eight dollars now. So now I have to bid ten dollars to get a ten dollar bill. So I don't, so I don't take a net loss. And now that person at $9 realizes, wait a second, I have to pay $11 now. So I don't take a net loss. So I can take a net loss of $1 versus a net loss of $8. And you can kind of see people just realize they've hit. I, I saw this done in a class once. It was fantastic. You can see the students realize, oh God, I've just fallen into a trap kind of idea. And the, the, the instructor, of course, will call it off because otherwise it'd be unethical, but it's, those kind of things aren't, aren't experiments on the class, not in the data collecting experiment. Those are demonstrations and useful learning techniques that, uh, that stick with you. I wasn't even in the class. I was literally walking with my best friend past the hallway and we, uh, after, because we were, we were co-teaching and we, uh, we passed that and, and, we're, and, and we saw one of the econ professors do it and, we're, and we just stuck our heads in and he's like, hey, can I help you? And I'm like, no, we're just watching. I'm like, no, we, 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 we're just watching. This is amusing every time. <laughs> and, the, <laughs> and the students didn't, st they still fell for it. So um, it's, it's, so yeah, that's my lecture for today. Um,